A Mind for Numbers Written by Barbara Oakley Chapter 1 Open the Door When you can't do something, you probably start avoiding it, and that's your biggest mistake. The author didn't know much about math since she was a child, so she avoided it until she needed it at work, so she started all over again. She realized she had a different approach to the topic than others, but by changing the techniques and methods of learning, she began to succeed. And the more she was good at, the more she liked mathematics. Absolutely everyone can study it. If you can catch a fastball flying at you, then you already have an aptitude for mathematics, as this process requires performing complex calculations. Chapter 2. Simplicity is the best approach. When you first look at a chapter of a math or science textbook, first run your eyes through the entire section, making up the big picture. Look at the diagrams, photos, headings, conclusions, and questions at the end of the text. It takes a minute or two, but it'll help you organize your thoughts and break down the information into portions. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. First you need to grasp the main concepts or principles and only then complete them with details. And even before you start reading, you're creating subtle neural hooks for perception that will make it easier for you to absorb the material. Focused and diffuse thinking. In your daily life, you are in one of these thought modes. In a diffuse state, the brain is able to think in the background about things that you are not currently focused on. Because of it, a person has sudden insights about a previously unsolved problem. This thinking isn't related with any particular area of the brain. Focused thinking, on the other hand, directly addresses the task. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for it. As soon as you pay attention to something, focused thinking kicks in. In focused thinking, the neurons are close to each other, while in an unfocused thinking, they are not so dense. In the first case, we will look for a solution to the problem from what we already know. And it's not certain that it will lead to a correct answer. For example, when multiplying numbers, it'll only help us if we know the multiplication table. But imagine that we are given a task that we encounter for the first time. We will also begin to look for the answer to it in familiar ways, that is, by comparing this problem with those it is similar to. And so we may not be able to find the answer, because neural connections can be located in different parts of the brain. If we read a textbook before making a decision, we'll clearly understand in which part of the brain we should look for the answer. But diffuse thinking allows you to look at the world much more broadly without getting hung up on one area. And when you learn something new, you build new neural connections. These two mindsets can be compared to a flashlight that has a focused beam and diffused light. It follows that to learn something new, always turn on diffused thinking. In creativity, usually the more you try to tune your brain, the less creative the ideas will be. For example, in diffused thinking, when you're just playing your guitar without thinking, you can do much better guitar passages than if you sit down to compose purposefully, focusing on the music. To make it even clearer what focused attention is, make a square out of these two triangles. Surely it will turn out like this. Now I'm going to add two more triangles. Make a square out of them. And this is where many people may make a mistake. They'll assemble a rectangle. But in fact, the square should look like this. As you already understood, you have followed a well-known path. To figure out the transition from focus to diffuse thinking, complete the following task. Move the three coins so that the triangle is angled upwards. If you relax your perception and defocus your attention without focusing on anything in particular, then the solution will come very easily. Some children solve this problem right away, but professors, on the contrary, admit defeat. If you want to decide for yourself, press pause. Here is the answer. Chapter 3, To Learn is to Create More than a thousand patents are registered in the name of Tom Edison. His phenomenal ingenuity is due to his extraordinary ability to change ways of thinking. For most people, the transition from one type of thinking to another occurs naturally, it's enough to go for a walk, sleep, or do something that involves other parts of the brain, such as listening to music or scratching the stomach of a hamster. The main thing is to distract the brain from the task until it fades. Inspiration has come to many famous writers during long walks, because at this time diffused thinking comes into play, and thought runs over a wide space until it finds a solution. When you return to the problem, you'll notice how easy it is to find a solution, or you'll realize you've advanced in understanding. 
Edison's secret was that when solving complex problems, he did not dwell on finding a solution. He went to take a nap in his armchair in the living room, having previously taken a bearing in his hand. As he fell asleep and the bearing fell from his hand, the scientist would wake up and grab the thoughts that had come into his relaxed brain to use for new inventions. The same technique was used by Salvador Dali, who called it sleep without sleep. During your studies, change your thinking patterns, that is, make work periods not too long. When the energy runs out, you can take a short break or switch to another task, such as moving from math to learning a foreign language, and then back again. At the same time, the first task will be thought through in a diffused mode, and when you move on to it again, it'll be easier for you. But you also need short breaks when you don't need to pay close attention. During this time, you can draw, take a shower, or listen to music without words. Meanwhile, don't chase anyone. In this way, you wouldn't allow yourself to spend too much time learning the material and will fall behind even more, and soon you will completely stop studying these subjects, since you will not succeed. First, break down the material into chunks that you can learn, and then organize your time so that you can focus on each part as much as possible. And by learning the material slowly but deeply, it'll be easier to learn the subject in the future. If you don't learn the basics, then further learning won't make any sense. Try not to get hung up on the first idea that comes to your mind. This can prevent you from finding easier solutions. For example, chess players who get stuck in this way genuinely believe that they are thinking about an alternative solution and looking for it on the board. However, an analysis of the direction of their gaze shows they are still thinking the same thought. In this case, you need to switch to diffuse mode. A study found that when you close your eyes, even when blinking, it deactivates your attention and allows you to momentarily refresh your perception. So when you're thinking about a task, intentionally close your eyes. This will allow the brain to go into a diffused mode and look at the matter in a new way. One of the best chess players would get up during his opponent's move and turn away from the board. This allowed him to look at board with fresh look. It's like a brick wall leaving time between periods of focused attention, the neural connections will settle down and become stronger. But if you memorize in a short time, neural connections will not be fixed in long-term memory. Therefore, resting between difficult tasks is very beneficial. Working memory and long-term memory. Working memory is the part of memory that deals with current, consciously processed information. It can be compared to a blackboard. It can hold as little as four pieces of information, and you need to make some effort to comprehend and remember a concept, after which it will start to take up less space in your working memory, and you will be able to internalize other concepts. To memorize information, close your eyes and repeat it to yourself several times. Or if it's a math problem, solve it several times, and then do a little exam for yourself. After that, the information will be transferred to long-term memory. Long-term memory can be compared to a warehouse where information stays for a long time. It can hold billions of objects. And the more often the information is repeated, the closer to the entrance it is, and the easier it is to recall, so spaced repetition will be effective, for example, when you repeat information every day. Sleep and learning is very important. When you are awake, toxic substances are formed in the brain, and when you go to sleep, the cells shrink, due to which the distance between them increases significantly, that is, your brain is cleaned. So, if you sleep too little, you'll be less intelligent. Also, during sleep, the brain turns to the areas where you are trying to learn something and strengthens neural connections in this place, so that everything will be remembered better in the morning. Chapter 4. Pieces of Information Trying to recall the material you're learning is much more effective than just rereading, but students mostly do the latter. Yes, each time the information will come more easily, which gives students the illusion that they have understood and remembered it, but when the time comes, they will not remember it. Rereading is only useful in the case of spaced repetition of information, so after reading a term, look away and repeat it while trying to understand it better, and then read it again and again. And you'll be surprised how easier it is to understand the material. When reading a book, you can underline the most important points or write notes and thoughts in the margins, which also helps to remember the information. Rewriting the notes and, most importantly, reviewing the material before bed can also help.
After you've read something and tried it twice, you form a weak neural connection. But when you're doing something regularly, neural connection becomes more strong. Therefore, it is necessary to repeat the information the next day. And in any science, you need daily practice so that you don't even think about what to do next when solving this or that problem. At the same time, try to alter the solution of the problem in different ways. This way, your brain won't be fixated on one thing and will always be ready to find a new solution. And when you come across several of the same examples in your homework, shuffle them up so that they alternate. This will allow you to switch modes of thinking. And remember, detailed notes in the classroom and half-hour work with a teacher replaces dozens of hours of work with a textbook. Therefore, you should aim to study from the very beginning. Chapter 5. How to Resist Procrastination You will succeed in any business if you devote enough time to your lessons every day. But usually, procrastination holds us back because we don't like it. This is the most harmful habit, and if you get rid of it, you will achieve a lot. At the same time, thoughts about the upcoming lesson are considered painful. But when the person starts the lesson, the pain disappears. But as stated earlier, there will be no pain if you are great at this subject. In any case, you need to find the strength to just get started. Procrastination looks like that. At first, you think or look at what you need to do, and you get uncomfortable. Then you shift your thoughts or attention to a more enjoyable activity, such as watching videos. And after getting a temporary pleasure from it, two hours later you find that you haven't done anything yet. And then tell yourself that tomorrow morning you will definitely start. That is, you find a thousand reasons to postpone the lesson. And that's usually because you want to do it all at once. Therefore, break down the task into smaller ones so that you don't bother yourself too much during the day, but practice every day. A habit is when the brain falls into a previously programmed state. It saves our energy and allows us to free our consciousness for other activities. For example, before, in order to reverse the car, a large flow of information swirled in your head. But as soon as the neural network is formed, the brain enters a zombified state and you do it without thinking. A habit has four stages. First, the signal is a trigger that puts you in a zombified state. Secondly, the sequence of actions is your usual order of actions. Thirdly, reward. Habits arise and persist only because we get a little bit of pleasure from them as a reward. Therefore, you should always reward yourself for any unpleasant activity. And fourth, faith. You have to believe that by doing this, you will achieve something, otherwise it will seem pointless to you. To get rid of bad habits, first, find out what signal leads to procrastination. For example, you can go to the private messages of any social network and then start surfing the internet. Or when you receive a message, you check what was written to you in the mail. And again, you lose a few hours. And if you find such a signal, get rid of it. Turn off your phone and do not log in while working on the social network. Then set a timer of at least 25 minutes and dive into the tasks completely. And after the signal, you can reward yourself. Secondly, you may get distracted in class, so leave your phone in the car before class. Or if you find it difficult to study at home because you are drawn to the computer, study in the library. Thirdly, punish yourself in some way if you got distracted, so your brain will understand it is unpleasant. And fourth, you need to set yourself up for the fact that what you're doing now is going nowhere, and you're only wasting your time. And then redirect your thoughts to the correctness of the new approach. While working, you may still have different thoughts in your head, you need to learn not to react to them. Chapter 6. Methods, Tips, and Tricks The best way to get things done on time is to make a list of key tasks for the day, week, and month. And try not to postpone things to another day. If such a list is made, it will be more difficult for you to slack off from work, as your conscience will push you. Or hang a picture on the wall of your success. And whenever you're distracted, look at it. This way, your brain understands all your efforts will pay off. You can also install an app that will prevent you from using the internet at a certain time. And when you're studying for an exam, organize all the tasks and solutions so that you can quickly review them. For example, bookmark your textbook and stick a sticky note with a handwritten solution to each problem. It'll make it easier to run through the entire book. 
Chapter 7 Improving Memory Everyone can learn to memorize everything with the help of mnemonics. To do this, simply imagine a formula or a word in the form of an image. For example, for Newton's formula, the image might be a flying mule driven by an ant, since F could mean flying, M could mean mule, and it could mean ant. Or imagine the formula as it is, in the form of an image. For example, in the following formula, work is when we apply force to a heavy box to move it some distance. So imagine having a hard time pushing a box somewhere. When learning English words, associate the pronunciation of a word or parts of a word with some images. For example, the word belly, stomach, can be broken down into two parts, STO, which sounds almost like stop, and MAC, which we can associate with hamburgers. Now imagine that a person stops eating McDonald's hamburgers. And when you visualize it clearly, it will be so vividly deposited in your head that it will not be difficult to remember the word. In a similar way, you can easily memorize 50 words a day. This concludes the book. Subscribe to the channel, like, click on the bell and leave your opinion about this book in the comments.